For those of you that are new to stocks and the financial markets, welcome to the show. If this is your first FOMC meeting, the stock market gained and lost on the back of a Jerome Powell that was dovish in some ways and hawkish in other ways. So who do we believe in a sea of mysteries? In times like these, we let price action do the talking and we react accordingly. So today, we're gonna break down the move in bonds, stocks, and commodities to decipher what the market thinks will happen next. Are we due for more downside or was Powell's words enough? Also, we need to talk about earnings. Some big names have missed earnings by a lot. The market reacted accordingly and we need to discuss their impact on the Q1 earnings outlook for the S&P 500. Could earnings finally be unraveling to the downside. We're going to talk about that and much, much more. So let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. It really, really helps me out. Cheers. Guys, when you have all of this economic data, FOMC, QRA earnings all come together in a single week, you kind of get the mess that we have right here. And you could see a lot of the big moves we saw, stuff like AMD, Starbucks, CVS Health right here. A lot of that had to do with the earnings front but then we also saw stuff like banks diversified asset management capital markets you know insurance regional banks all of these sub sectors inside financials do really really well and that was because of the fomc at the same time the mega caps actually did gain at least most of them google meta microsoft amazon you know apple didn't lose quite as much as nvidia right here and then tesla giving a lot of last week's gains back but you know it was just following the trend of you know discretionary other than that you know real estate was pretty up upbeat on the FOMC. Stocks gained, stocks lost. This is really what happens when you get a massive push-pull effects from monetary, fiscal, the earning side, the macro side, the fundamental side. You kind of get really mixed action and that's what we saw today. And you know what? Sectors were trading in unison for most of the day up until Powell came up and speak. And Powell is a real market mover. You can see right here, he started speaking at 2.30. The second he opened his mouth, he started sounding a little less hawkish than people thought and markets absolutely rallied. And as his speech unraveled, the markets began to sell off. Look at regionals, utilities, XLC, GDX, XLB. These were all very, very positive. In fact, the majority of sectors actually outperformed the SPY. The only sectors that didn't was discretionary, and that's because they dumped. And they would have been worse if Amazon didn't participate in the rally there. Then we saw staples lost. Same with technology here, energy and semiconductors. So, you know, rate sensitive, high beta, cyclical names just didn't participate here, excluding, you know, staples. I don't know why. And every Everything else really did outperform the S&P 500 on the day. In fact, more sectors actually came in even or gained than actually lost on today's trade. Considering how red yesterday was, I thought today was gonna be a deep, deep red day. That is simply not the case. So why did we have all this volatility? What exactly did Powell say? Well, I have a revised version of his key points. Number one, they held interest rates as is. So the Fed funds rate is 5.25 at the moment to 5.5. That is the federal funds rate, the benchmark they're using. Now, things the market didn't like. Uh, Jerome Powell came out and said in recent months, inflation has shown a lack of further progress towards the 2% objective. We kind of knew that. And he said, it's taken longer than previously expected to get confident enough to cut rates. And again, even though the market kind of knows this, right? Just him saying it is just de facto hawkish. Some of the good things he said, um, cuts to interest rates are likely, okay, tick which means hikes are not on the table. I think it's unlikely that the next policy rate move will be a hike, the market likes that. And pretty much it came out here and said that it's gonna start shrinking its balance sheet uh, here in June. At the same time, we also got a bit of news on the QRA fund. The US is gonna hold its quarterly debt sales steady, so there's gonna be no real changes, and it's gonna start buybacks this month for the first time since 2000, 2001. And you know, the market saw this as relatively positive. Some of the comments he made, relatively negative. And let's quickly hop on the charts and I'll show you how everything moved on the day. Guys, so here we are on the charts and today was defined as volatility is the price you pay to invest. Look at this candle here on the S&P 500, an immensely volatile day. And that was pretty much after Powell came out and spoke as well as some of the bigger names in stuff like healthcare, CVS reported. And you know, that did create volatility in the healthcare sector. However, let's actually go through everything really, really quickly. So the S&P 500 lost 0.34% and after yesterday's red candle, you thought it was going to be an immense day, but no, only lost 0.3% there. The Nasdaq 0.7%. The Dow Jones actually did gain 0.45% today. The RSI
RSP lost 0.34%. So the Dow Jones, which is mostly filled with like healthcare stocks, banks did gain. So that's very, very interesting to see that mid caps gained as well. Same with the S&P 600 and the IWM. And we can also see some very upbeat action here in the extended hours. IWM up 0.38%. That's nearly a 0.6% gain in total for the IWM. The spies up after hours, same with growth, same with value. Yeah, you can actually see futures here as well. Upbeat as well. The NASDAQ futures, RTY futures, ES futures. So the market really liking what Powell said. And we really saw that in intraday trade today. I mean, if we just hop on the five minute chart, right? Look at this move. So open like right here. Okay, so that's where we opened on the market and we pretty much did a bunch of nothing. Powell came out and spoke, rallied all the way up and then we actually came all the way down and you know, momentum brings momentum to the upside and downside and algos and CTAs all get on board this train right here. But this is a huge, huge move. You know, at one point the S&P 500 was up 1.43% and Powell's words really did affect yields. I mean, if we go ahead and look at the 10 year, we hop on the daily chart, we can actually see that the 10 year did move at down 1.1% today. So it does seem like we're sort of forming an interim top here in the 10 year. And if this is the top, this is going to support equities, especially if the 10 year does move down. I do think that markets have overreacted to the upside when it does come to the rate picture. And we did see that with today's trade, especially what happened with the S&P 500. So we'll see what happens as a result of yields moving lower. Bonds did gain ever so slightly. You can see an AGG TLT. And then let's have a look what happened to gold. Gold actually was green on the day. That's very, very interesting. What happened to the dollar? The dollar fell significantly. That's going to be supportive of equities. And then crude, I believe crude actually fell on an inventory build. And it does look like we're probably going to move into the $78, $77 range here for crude. All in all, it should find support at around here, the $77 mark. That's a big area of support. But let's hop on the S&P 500. Just talk a bit about the day, right? So first, we did say in yesterday's video and I do live streams now guys we were talking about what to expect in the S&P 500 we said that this 5,000 level right here is a very very key level that the market kind of needs to hold right and it is actually doing that we did see quite volatile trade now a definite win to the bears because it is a red body candle and they did part all of the day's gains and some finishing below the close of yesterday however you do have to look at this as constructive number one we're above the 5,000 level number two this would actually still represent a higher low we're trying to put in and we rally right here okay go and break this high that would then mean we actually put in a higher low on this relief rally and a higher high but that's in the future that's not yet there and there is still risk to us moving below this 5,000 strike and into this balance area right here which does open 4200 that would mean a lower low relative to this low right here and that can actually open up lower levels however i am convicted on the fact that we will find immense support here at the 4920 level if we do go down that being said as long as we're above 5000 right now i mean as long as we're above this 5000 level right now i do support higher prices for the most part because it would be a higher low relative to this right here so until we actually break convincingly and i'm talking about a close below the 5000 area i am still looking for a higher high and for us to go higher here in this market especially with Powell's words but 4MC is done rates are unchanged QRA is not bullish or bearish it's kind of neutral everything now comes down to Apple's earnings as well as NFP on Friday so a quick sentiment check guys this is the Bofa bull bear indicator it rose to 5.1 from 5 as you can see right here do take into consideration we were at 7.1 just a couple of weeks ago the Goldman Sachs sentiment indicator actually did tick up as well so we did see a tick up here in these indicators now do take into consideration that both these indicators right here are actually released at the start of each week so it doesn't quite account for the price action we've seen this week that being said we can still look at it it's still a great gauge of sentiment and right now what these indicators are telling us is to hold the assets we do have hold equities right and if you want to start nibbling it definitely is a good time although better prices can ensue especially if this does go down downward here and we do move closer to the buy area here in the bull bear indicator now let's talk a bit about earnings so we have mastercard today cvs health Kraft heinz riot qualcomm carvana we're gonna look at mastercard so mastercard's earnings guys so they beat on eps 3.31 versus 3.24 but they actually missed on sales ever so slightly right here and um yeah the market didn't really like this 
this. A lot of people saw this as the consumer weakening, but take it into context, Visa actually beat on both. Visa had a great quarter. So I think this is just MasterCard specific more than it is the consumer weakening or anything like that. In fact, the MasterCard team came out and said the consumer actually remains pretty resilient in their call. Um, they also repurchased 4.4 million shares and paid $160 million in dividends in Q1. The market like that now looking at the scorecard guys i do know we look at this every single day of the week but we have to because earnings are changing so significantly you see this number right here it actually moved up yesterday we were sitting at 5.6 we're now at six percent earnings growth look at the start of earnings season 3.5 percent guys this is getting crazy excess bmy adjustment which is very weird i don't like the fact that this is a part of the earnings season that we have to track 9.1 percent earnings growth we're nearly looking at double digit growth here in the S&P 500, excluding this very weird adjustment we got, and then 8.9% X energy. So we are tracking well above seasonality. Guys, the fundamental picture from an earnings perspective is holding up really, really well. The troubling thing is just the macro side that's really causing us problems in this market right now. And if we actually have a look at earnings surprise, this is the pre-COVID average earnings surprise. Guys, we are tracking earnings surprise well above the average. In fact, 7% above your standard expectations. So earnings are coming in good. And we're actually going to have a look at some commentary from some pretty notable names in the space relative to the consumer. And this is just like stuff like Fiserv, Pepsi, TransUnion, and Visa giving us their opinion and what they think on the consumer. So Fiserv CEO, at a macro level, consumer spending remains resilient. The early read on April is that growth is tracking slightly ahead of the Q1 average. Here on PepsiCo, I would say that the consumer globally, we think is very resilient and we see it in, as you saw from my international business performance, and it's basically supported by two facts, very low unemployment or quite low unemployment globally and wages growing at a good pace in majority of countries where we participate. Visa, consumer spending across all segments from low to high spend has remained relatively stable. Our data does not indicate any meaningful behavior change across consumer segments. Consumer finances, the TransUnion CEO, Christopher Cartwright, consumer finance in the US has remained healthy due to low unemployment and real wage growth. So, you know, looking at some of these great parameters for the consumer, it does look like the consumer is holding in there. And this is not just in the US, this is globally. Despite what we're seeing in some of the data points, the earnings data, as well as the CEOs of these companies, they're coming out and saying, hey, the consumer is resilient, they're remaining strong, and it's mostly due to low unemployment and real wage growth. And it's not just in the US, it is globally. And essentially, what this data right here is telling me is that companies are struggling to pass on costs onto the consumer, not necessarily that the consumer is weakening. In fact, I showed you this chart for the last couple of days. Consumer spending is still running well above trend and that's because disposable income and employee compensation is still relatively high. In fact, outpacing inflation. So the consumer is not weakening. Companies are just struggling to pass on costs and that could be because of a whole range of reasons. Consumer resistance, changing habits, competition, but it's not necessarily because the consumer is weakening. The data just doesn't support that fact as of yet. Now let's talk about fund managers. What are they doing in these times? So this is the NAM exposure number. It just tells us how exposed US fund managers are to US stocks. And right now they're sitting at about 60%. We have come down from about this 100, slightly above 100 area where fund managers were levered long. We're now sitting at 60% exposure. So what have fund managers been buying or selling in that time? According to Bofa's private client data, the majority of fund managers actually bought comp service they bought healthcare in the last week but actually sold healthcare in the last four weeks. And then they also bought energy and financials. They were also a seller of technology in the last four weeks, as well as staples and real estate last week. But they've been a net buyer of staples in the last four weeks. So some very interesting data right there. All in all, fund managers are still net buyers in this market. Although do take this data with a grain of salt because this data covers this period right here. And it's probably about a week old. Now let's talk a bit about the macro because right now, the fundamental is looking really good. It's just the macro, right? That's not looking too good. And the macro is affecting the technical side of things. So this right here, not looking that great, but the fundamental is looking really, really good. And this is great commentary here from Bob Elliott. He said, the biggest challenge for asset holders right now is bond yields. 
They are high and rising enough to create a drag on asset prices, but not high enough to create the economic slowdown required for the Fed to ease. And I don't know how else to say that. He just said it exactly as it is. There's not much more I could add to that. Now, part of the reason why bond yields are rising actually has to do with US government debt, fiscal spending. You can see this is the debt to GDP ratio of the United States. And you can see that debt to GDP right now is sitting at about 100%. It's never been this high in history apart from the COVID outbreak, and it has increase on this linear path since the year 2008 here at the Lehman Brothers collapse. This is when the world said that stimulus can fix everything and but at the end of the day it's only a short-term fix. However debt to GDP is forecast to move above 150 percent here in 2050 and I don't think this is sustainable in the long term. That being said where we are right now is where we are and it's part of the reason why bond yields are moving. The market is setting the rate saying hey government get in control of your fiscal spending. That being said, looking at US corporates debt to GDP, US stocks actually remain relatively low. This is non-financial corporations outstanding debt as a percentage of GDP. And we're sitting well under the 60 mark, probably close to 50% right here. So I think US corporates are relatively healthy relative to the UK and the Euro area as a whole. The Euro area is really a good parameter for what the US might look like. I do know the US stock market's a lot bigger, but it's the next biggest comparison. And that's why US stock stocks actually trade at a premium to the rest of the world. Look at the PE ratio of the US compared to stuff like Canada, here South America, compared to Australia, even parts of Europe, right? That is because US corporates, their balance sheets are really, really healthy and it's just extremely high quality businesses. And as we discussed yesterday, high quality factors often trade at a valuation premium relative to the history. Look at margins high versus low, balance sheets strong versus weak, returns versus high versus low, and low volatility versus high high volatility, and this is a large part of the US market. It's what you get in the S&P 500, and that's why the S&P 500 trades at a valuation premium to the rest of the world. Another reason why US stocks trade at a valuation premium has to do with the fact that the USD is the world's reserve currency. When you hold US stocks, you hold it in US dollars, and that is the world's reserve currency. US dollars are accepted everywhere. Here in Australia, right, if you go to like a Woolworths or a Coles, they're the major supermarket brands in Australia. If you are ask to pay in US dollars, they might call a manager, but if you really have nothing else, they will accept it. They will accept US dollars. And the same is true in most of Africa, all of Europe, all of South America. The US dollar is the world's reserve currency. It's virtually accepted everywhere. And that's part of the reason why US stocks trade at a valuation premium. Now let's talk gamma. Now looking at gamma guys, very interesting. We're gonna go over it really, really quickly. Now something, a huge development is that the call gamma resistance actually moved to 5,200. That means bullish bets are actually moving up the tape. That's very near all-time highs, FYI. 5,000 is still the put support and the gamma flip zone is at 5,100. We are still in elevated levels here of negative gamma, however. 5,000 continues to be the support zone that we have broken and we did close below, but you know, it, it's just been a very sticky strike that once we've gotten through it, we've just rallied quite significantly. We saw yes last week with the relief rally. So 5,000 is a very, very strong zone here for the buyers and sellers. And right now is the ultimate key as to where this market will go. So watch the 5,000 strike, but very interesting to see the call gamma resistance moved up to 5,200. If we break this gamma flip zone, we're buying dips, selling rips all the way to 5,200 here, guys. So just a couple of notable things there. Very, very interesting take. And we can also see, hard to see, but the 5,300 strike is building out as well here. So a lot of bullish bets happening in the market despite the elevated levels of, of gamma we're seeing in the tape here. So do expect that once we get above this 5100, we're gonna really make our way to the 5200, especially towards that May OPEX. So guys, looking at seasonality, and you would have seen this first on Twitter, if you guys follow me on Twitter or X, so go ahead, follow me, so you get stats like these even before these videos. Now this is the median two week S&P 500 returns since 1950. And as you can see, the first half of May right here, the first two weeks of May, 10 to be rather flat. And in fact, the first half of May is actually the fourth worst two week period for the year in the S&P 500. We can actually then see that the second half of May right here ranks right in the middle. So historically speaking, you wanna buy the dip here on the first half of May if we do get a substantial pullback because the second half of May tends to be very, very positive seasonally speaking. Now talking about seasonality, looking at election years, uh, probably a more relevant composite cycle. So this is the S&P 500 performance after a big start in an election year.
here and you can see that we got sort of like a very relevant cycle right here they use these election years and then what we're doing right now here in 2024 you can clearly see that we normally do actually get a pullback here in the April May June period and then we normally do put in the bottom for the year for what is a spectacular year of double digit returns in the S&P 500 now according to the cycle right here we've actually gone below this level which probably means we could chop around in this May June area that chop could actually look like this it could look like this it could look anywhere in between the probability suggests that we probably just have a very choppy May maybe a choppy June find a bottom and then rally from there I do believe that risk is still to the upside in the S&P 500 despite the weakness we've seen in the last three to four weeks and when you look at everything in context right now the S&P 500 is literally on its average path we're up about five percent for the year a little bit more I believe and we're tracking about the average year in the S&P 500 so you know guys this pullback we're seeing completely normal it's just how markets operate we're going to look at some BOFA charts we look at these every single week because 78 percent of fund managers have access to BOFA data which means these are the charts that they're looking at even if they just glaze them it means that we can have the same edge that they do this is the S&P 500 chart with 40 week and 200 week moving averages you can see we are above the moving averages we formed a cup and handle we've broken out and a measured move takes us to as high as 6150 5600 and the 5200 you could actually see that according to the measured move we've actually hit the first upside target of 5200 we're pulling back as scheduled we can find support here at 4819 to the 4700 area so pretty much the 4800 area is where we're going to find support according to this chart before we do probably continue the rally to the further upside targets 5600 6150 if we do go below the 4800 region there is again support here at 4637 to 4595 along with the the 40 moving average we could also coincide with that right there so if we do pull back in the next couple of weeks to this area there could be a lot of confluence with this key support zone right here as well as the moving average next chart is the nasdaq 100 very similar situation we got a cup and handle with rising moving average Averages. we broke out from this cup and handle now a measured move takes us to 19,500 21,200 and 23,000 but we have actually pulled back after this spectacular rally and we are retesting critical support in the Nasdaq 100 right here which was the previous all-time high in 2021 resistance turned support this is always going to be a strong support zone however if we do break this support zone it looks like there's also strong support here at the 16,000 level we can actually pull back in a material way but there's a lot of support here for the Nasdaq 100. Looking at the Dow Jones, we have this big base. We've then broken out from this big base and we've had quite a stunning rally. You can see a measured move takes us to 39,300, 42,600, 45,200 on the upper end. We actually did break above the 39,300 to 39,900. We are now pulling back, finding a little bit of support. There's also support here at the 36,950 level, 35,700 level, and the 40 week moving average is rising here. So if we do pull back, there's quite a bit of support. So it does look like based on the technical charts, there is room for industry to pull back however they are pulling back into very critical levels of support where they will most likely find strong buyers now looking at the Nasdaq composite it's exactly like the Nasdaq 100 although slightly weaker I'm not going to go through it looking at the New York Stock Exchange composite very similar to the Dow Jones we have a big base right here you can then see we broke out above this line right here and a measured move takes us to 18,200 19,600 21,500 you can see that we've broken out on this line right here we tested the 18,200 measured move we are actually pulling back it's looking like we're retesting and then we can go up and reach the higher targets of 19,621.5 however if we break this retest zone right here we will actually find support at the 16,400 16,200 level so that could be material downside for the New York Stock Exchange composite so the NYSE really needs to find support and make a move right now and we'll see how that goes this index doesn't have a lot of the big tech names so we can actually see a move divergent of tech and semiconductors in this index that being said it's at a critical zone if it doesn't hold here the next zone is 16,400 down which is about four to five percent downside from the retest zone looking at the equal weight you can see a very big base here probably a correction in time we've broken out above the correction we found strong resistance at the 169 level we're pulling back and now we're at the 158 
level where we're finding support and we could find support to as low as the 155 zone here in the equal weight but that's probably the zone where we want to find absolute support otherwise we do risk falling back into this correction in time right here and this would be a failed breakout that being said measured move upside targets take us to 177 185 the rsp needs to find support between the 158 155 zone and then we can make a move the 177 185 measured move and that would take us well above all time highs now looking at sectors these are the sectors versus the S&P 500 so if this chart is moving up it means the sector is doing better if this chart is moving down it means the S&P 500 is outperforming said sector so we can see here that consumer discretionary it's having a bit of outperformance here as you can see mostly based on Tesla's and Amazon's results however in aggregate the S&P 500 has outperformed consumer discretionary and you look at stocks like Lulu like Nike the S&P 500 has just done way way better financials complete outperformance in the last year that's why I have American Express and PayPal in my portfolios and you can definitely see I do think this outperformance in financials will continue mostly based on the fact that they're very very cheap technology finding a bit of resistance at this 108 zone right here that being said for the better part of the year we have outperformed the S&P 500 and it does look like there's a higher low being put in relative to these highs right here we'll have to see what happens this does look like a good buy zone relatively speaking looking at industrials wow what a pivot they formed a double bottom here and then moved higher very similar situation to energy without the double bottom energy has just been outperforming the S&P 500 however in both these sectors at some point the S&P 500 has outperformed on both charts very similar situation to the material sector like energy S&P 500 has outperformed but we've seen recent outperformance because of the inflation trade now real estate this has been a dumpster fire we had mild outperformance here towards the end of the year in 2023 however we can see that because of the rate situation we have had underperformance here in real estate better to hold the S&P 500 but I do think that real estate is looking ready for a rebound I recently invested in Vici consumer staples healthcare and utilities these defensive names you can see outperformance right here here and here and this is indicative of of defensives leading the broader market often a sign of short-term possibly medium-term market weakness and then communication services based on Meta's earnings you can see we have actually pulled back quite substantially but all in all the trend is up and comm services is definitely a sector you want to be in so data in the week ahead guys tomorrow we have initial jobless claims we've got the trade balance we've got non-farms we've got durable goods and then factory orders and then after that we got non-farms and we're expecting a 250k print anything high is hot anything below it is cool but really what you want to look at is the unemployment rate right and then average hourly earnings month over month 0.3 this is the big one that a lot of fund managers look for in terms of increasing inflation because it's pretty much wages is wage inflation increasing because wages play a big part into the overall CPI PCE front with regards to the inflation story and then we also have PMIs and ISM services on Friday so over the next week as well as FOMC today we've had a, v a lot of data points are coming in along with Apple earnings and a couple of other big names towards the end of the week guys but if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell like this video guys and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers